We were told there was a witness, a girl. A niece of yours, I believe. Let me fetch her. No need. We prefer to hear her testimony unadulterated. Littlefinger thinks the jig is up. I mean, he's pretty sure that it's over for him, and you can see his face, and it's, it's one of my favorite scenes in the season. He's not gonna be able to slither out of this one the way he has so many times before. He doesn't have powerful friends he can call on here, and ultimately, it all comes down to the word of Sansa. He's been teaching Sansa lessons for a long time now. He's been making grand statements to her about the nature of the world. I don't think it's ever occurred to him that she might be learning these lessons, taking these lessons on board. He's taught her for a long time how important it is to be a good liar. He tells her in episode five about knowing your strengths, use them wisely. And in episode seven, when he kisses her, he's teaching her a lesson about his own weakness and about her own strength relative to him, about how she can exercise control over him. And in this episode, she puts all those things together to show that she is indeed not a silly little girl who never learns, but she is a very smart girl who has learned a great deal from her teacher, enough that she can turn the tables on him and actually exercise real leverage over him. Why did you help me? If they'd have executed you, what would they have done with me? It's basically a devil you know kind of situation where Sansa doesn't know these other people and for all the creepiness of Littlefinger, he's, he's, he has protected her in some ways. You know, she's never come to serious harm with him and she does feel like she knows his motives. She reveals that she made a very Littlefinger-esque calculation about what was best for her and when she tells him that she knows what he wants, it's a pretty bald statement of saying, I know where your raw nerve is. I have figured out what I am to you, the confusing mix of daughter and second chance at the woman you loved, and I am prepared to use that against you if necessary. I think she's probably the only person so far to ever really get the upper hand with Littlefinger. Littlefinger is always three steps ahead of everybody, but he's suddenly finds himself one step behind this girl who he'd written off as a stupid little girl who never learns. Now tell me, what is your name? Ramsay Snow. No, not Ramsay Snow. From this day until your last day, you are Ramsay Bolton, son of Roose Bolton, Warden of the North. I think Roos is very pleasantly surprised that his bastard has turned out so well. Anything horrible that Ramsay has learned, he's learned from watching his father. I mean, Ramsay is a, a psychopath, and I don't think Roos qualifies as a psychopath, but even, they're both very extreme characters, even in the context of, of this pretty brutal world. And Ramsay has achieved, in Roos's eyes, tremendous things. He may have done them in an unorthodox manner, but most importantly, the way in which he used Theon to take Moat Caelan, which is a very important strategic position for Roos, Ramsay's proved himself to be a worthy successor. And I don't think Roos is all that worried about how Ramsay accomplishes the things he accomplishes. It's more the fact that he's accomplished them that's important to Roos. I love the way that Awan plays the moment. There's something where for a split second you almost feel yourself feeling for this person and how great it must feel for him to finally be recognized by his father until you remember that he's a murderous sociopath. Why did the usurper pardon you? Who do you think sent this to Marine? Who profits? This is the work of Tywin Lannister. He wants to divide us. If we're fighting each other, we're not fighting him. The pardon was signed the year we met. It's hard to keep a thing like that covered up forever, especially when your enemies are so invested in putting a wedge between you. I mean, they're a good team. They complement each other nicely in lots of ways that are really troublesome to the Lannisters especially. So it shouldn't be a surprise. I think it's just one of those things that in hindsight he probably should have told her a long time ago, and it's more the fact that he kept it from her than the fact that he did it, which seals his fate. I think from Danny's perspective, this is the most earth-shattering thing that could possibly happen to her. He's her rock and her anchor. The way in which he stops her from flying off into potentially dangerous directions. And when someone that important to you, that central to you, is shown to be not just a liar, but when their entire relationship to you is shown to be based upon a lie, I think it, it poisons every corner of her world with doubt and mistrust. 
from his perspective, he may have started as an informer, but she is his whole reason for being at this point. I mean, he's completely given up on his desire to return to Westeros in any way except by her side. Uh, his home now is wherever she happens to be. So this is really like being expelled from the garden for him. This is the worst thing that could happen to either of them. You told them I was carrying Drago's child? I yes or no? Calisa. Don't call me that. Did you tell them I was carrying Drogo's child? For her, it's, the, it's her child. When Viserys put her child in danger and pointed the sword at her stomach, you saw some, a switch flip in her. You saw something change, and she watched him die without blinking an eye, even though he was her brother and the only family she'd ever known. And when she realizes that Jorah was also responsible for putting that child in danger, so I think that's what closes the door on him forever. Do you remember cousin Orson, Orson Lannister? Of course. Wet nurse dropped him on his head and left him simple. Simple? Used to sit all day in the garden crushing beetles with a rock. <laughs> Why did he do it? What was it all about? I think Tyrion is faced with the imminence of his own likely end. He's with his brother, and in a situation like this, his thoughts naturally go to their shared experience, um, to happier times, maybe not happy times as such, but much happier than the situation that he's in now. And when he goes into his own past, his thoughts are going to go naturally to memories that resonate with his current situation. The memories that resonate with the questions he's probably asking himself right now. Why? Why is this happening to me? Is there any reason, is there any meaning behind the situation that I find myself in. I think that even if in his heart of hearts he probably thinks the answer is no, it would be really great to hear someone that he loves tell him otherwise. I think he's, there's definitely a grasping quality to his story. Uh, Peter and, and Nikolai both did such a fantastic job with it that you really feel the bond between these two brothers having what may well be the last conversation they ever have. Looks like very light armor. I like to move around. You could at least wear a helmet. You shouldn't drink before a fight. I always drink before a fight. What's really fascinating to me about Oberyn is he always does what he wants to do when he wants to do it, which sounds normal, but I don't think anyone really lives their life like that, or no sane people really do, because you'd get arrested or you'd get shot, you know? <laughs> Just you would, you, your life would be very, very short if you really did that. But Oberyn has no compromises, and on the one hand, it makes him a very admirable, kind of magnetic personality, because I think we all tend to have envy for someone who's that free and who's that courageous. You know, there's just, he never lets fear stop him from doing anything. On the other hand, as admirable as that might be, it's also really fucking dangerous, and it gets him in trouble, and, and you know, he chose the exact wrong time to do it. And it's not just killing the mountain that's important to him, because Oberyn always viewed the mountain as just a pawn, a very large pawn, but he He's Tywin Lannister's soldier, you know, and so if, if if the mountain committed an atrocity, it was with Tywin's at least his permission and, and possibly his direct command. And so for him, the mountain, ironically, is the little fish, and the big fish is Tywin. He really wants to prove that Tywin was behind all this. And so he wants the mountain to confess his guilt in front of Tywin, in front of all the lords and ladies of King's Landing, and that would be, that's the victory he's after, not just killing the mountain. And he's so close to getting that, or he feels like he's so close, but he gets a little bit careless. And you know, any other man in this position is down on his back, he's been speared through the gut, he's poisoned, you know, it would be fine, but the mountain is not like normal people. You know, he's freakishly strong and kind of refuses to die in this moment, and so, Oberyn gets a little bit careless and, and makes a fatal mistake. Uh, 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 